I'd like to thank everybody today uh, who are attending the conference in person and very pleased to know that you're being joined by others uh, online and around the country as we celebrate uh, this, our 50th anniversary here of Perfusion and also the 50 years of Perfusion innovation and Perfusion education and research done here at the Texas Heart Institute of Perfusion Technology. Denton A. Cooley completed 59 open heart procedures in 1956 using the DeWall Lily High oxygenator, bubble oxygenator. And, and, and that's with a finger pump. And if you want to see this in person, it's upstairs in the museum. I rebuilt that pump and it works beautifully. And we also have the old parts of the oxygenator too. Came out of my garage, some of them. <laughs> and later he used a so-called coffee pot that uh, we, it was found and uh, restored and uh, we put that up there also. It's actually made from restaurant supply items. Uh, this coffee pot, uh, you, the stainless steel sponges were located in the top, coated with anti-foam A treatment. You would bubble up the blood on the inside of the oxygenator. It would go through the stainless steel sponges, the blood would be defoamed, and then the blood would settle into the arterial reservoir. Now as a stainless steel reservoir, you couldn't see the operating level. So we had a, a glass tube on the side, like a coffee pot, so you can see the operating level. <laughs> Dr. Cooley actually established the Texas Art Institute in 1961. <clears throat> and he and his surgical staff at that particular time had completed 8,673 open heart procedures between 1956 and 1971. He recognized that there was a need for well-trained perfusionists or people running the heart and lung machines. We were called pump technicians back in those days to run the heart and lung machines. And in 1971, he hired Charles C. Reed from Ohio State Perfusion Department. He was an instructor there. And to become our chief perfusionist here at the Texas Heart Institute and the director of the perfusion school at Texas Heart Institute. Dr. Cooley and Charlie established the perfusion department and the school in December, 1971. The first perfusion class started on January, 1972. And they graduated six months later in June, 1972. Diane Clark was in, in that original class of four, four students. Her four, the students in her class, those four, along with seven other students that followed from the July to December class, participated in 1,759 pump cases, included both adults and pediatrics. Eventually, the pediatric cases were transferred to Texas Children's Hospital. Diane later became the Associate Director of Academics for the Perfusion School here, and after she graduated. Then in 1975, Charlie and Diane wrote the textbook of cardiopulmonary perfusion. Uh, and she was the co-author on that book. Charlie hired more perfusions in 1973, which was due to the increase in our clinical cases at that particular time uh, here at St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital and Texas Heart Institute. And one of the new employees was Bob Keenan as uh, seen on the far left there uh, behind Charlie. And Bob was actually a clinical instructor there at Ohio State also. And Bob was hired to become the associate director of the clinical perfusion. A few years later, Bob relocated to the Northwest and uh, then I became the uh, associate director of the clinical department. Charlie and Diane, Charlie, Diane and I extended the length of the program from six months to one year in 1977 because there was an increasing need for perfusions in our, around the country. And we also believe that we could enhance our educational opportunities <laughs> with the additional procedures that we were doing at that particular time. We accepted three volunteers from two classes, two separate classes in June of 77 and December of 77, and extended to the one-year program that we have. Uh, now we're back to it and again, and now we're back up again. I'm sorry, 18 months. We believed it was a good idea because we had never overlapped our classes before in the past. And we thought that these students, so-called senior students could help at our new junior students. As it turned out, it was a good decision because those two overlapping classes of 30 students helped the 10 of us perfusionists do 4,074 open heart procedures in 1977. We actually took this slide or this picture and we made it into a Christmas card for all of our perfusion friends around the country. So 
basically there was eight of us pumping cases every day and for those cases. So we were very fortunate at that time. Now the pioneering efforts of the perfusions from the 1950s and 60s led to what I refer to as our golden era. Those of us that worked in the 70s and 80s because we were in that trans trans you know, you know, transition of reusable uh, devices, stainless steel, glass, et cetera, and going into disposable cardiopulmonary devices. And we evaluated almost every new device that ever came on the marketplace, including <laughs> their future revisions. <laughs> the following devices includes most, but not all of the devices we use for the past 60 years or 50 years. And due to limited time today, uh, I'm not gonna show you those slides, I'm sorry, there's just not enough time. But many of them can be seen in those textbooks I've referred to written by Charlie Reed and co-authored by Diane Clark and uh, Trudy Stafford. So instead, this is going to be my reference for the pump, the tubing, filters, oxygenators. Bubble oxygenators included adult and pediatric oxygenators, including from Travanol, TMP, and we also had a Cooley bag oxygenator. We had stainless steel plates that we put around the outside of the bag for warming and cooling. These disposable oxygenators led to our use of the Bentley, Harvey, Cove, Shally, the Deco hard shelled oxygenators. Uh, and there are many revisions over the years, and I'm not aware of any of them being used today. Then we went to membrane oxygenators. For membrane oxygenators, initially we used devices from the Londe Edwards, the Travanol TMO oxygenator, and the Symed Colabo Lung membranes in various sizes. And again, they're no longer available today. But the technology led to the development of other membranes that came with and without uh, soft shell reservoirs and hard shell venous reservoirs. I mentioned that because the soft shell reservoirs or the bags that we refer to them offered us a sense of safety. And because of that, the bags would collapse and prevent you from pumping air. And today you use the hard shell reservoirs for simplicity, ease of use, et cetera. And they came from various companies like Medtronic, Bentley, Cove, Shally, Soren, Sarn, Sturumo, Yosef, Rebecca, Spectrum, et cetera. I think it's noteworthy that for myself, in the 70s, when, when the TMO was available, I ordered the bracket, the circuit board for the TMO membrane oxygenator. And it took me several months to get it approved. The reason why is because biomedical engineering refused to approve the electrical circuit board. And I had to explain to them numerous times, it was a board, a plastic board and some brackets used to hold the oxygenator onto the heart lung machine. Eventually, a few months later, they allowed us to use the TMO membrane. Venous reservoirs. Again, we started using the venous reservoir bags with our membrane oxygenators for safety. It's kind of like an IV bag and it closes when it's empty, similar, to, uh, but the bubble oxygenators are the same way. Eventually, the perfusion department did move towards the hard shelled reservoirs uh, for its simplicity. Cardiotomy reservoirs. <clears throat> we initially used non filtered cardiotomy reservoirs and attached in external depth filters and foam filters and various uh, types of filters, screen filters below the reservoir for additional filtration. A few years later, the manufacturers manufactured the cardiotomy reservoirs with built-in filters inside the reservoir and we used those. Filters, we did numerous studies used for transfusion, cardiotomy filtration, arterial blood filtration, oxygen and, uh, oxygen and CO2 filtration, gas filters, pre-bypass filtration. These studies showed the necessity uh, uh, to use these appropriate filters uh, during, cardi during and before, during and after cardiopulmonary bypass. I would like to point out that the Texas Heart Institute Perfusion School and, and the clinical instructors, we did a paper back at that time on pre-bypass filtration. We were the first in the country, in the world, to report particulate matter inside the oxygenator. Some of them kind of look like a snow cone or snow globe, uh, and hence the reason for pre-bypass filtration. Tubing. We use polyvinyl chloride tubing. We use a, actually a polyvinyl chloride tubing with a, a polyurethane coating on the inside and silicone tubing. The polyurethane tubing inside coating, uh, that didn't work out so well, so eventually it was discontinued. But the standard PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and the silicone remain, and we also reviewed the use of non-coating coated tubing uh, that is used today. Monitoring devices. We measured everything in cardiopulmonary bypass. We measured the pre and the post pressure sites of the hemoconcentrators. 
membrane oxidators, arterial filters, water temperature sites, other blood sites. We even monitored the high and low blood levels. We monitored the blood water flows, blood and water flows. We monitored blood gases, coagulation, et cetera. The results from these studies led to changes in our perfusion practices. Cardioplegia, initially we only delivered uh, crystalloid cardioplegia antigrade, but eventually we did start administering cardioplegia retrograde with, with and without blood and crystalloid, warm and cold, high and low flow rates and various temperatures. Cannula, we use a wide variety of arterial and venous cannula from various companies. And uh, <clears throat> those cannula were revised to accommodate the, the size of our patients and also their entry sites. Cannula were also redesigned due to the changes in the uh, transition from our exclusive gravity return to kinetic assist venous return and vacuum assist venous, venous return. And that was partly due also, there was an increased number of microemboli generated from vacuum assist and et cetera, from assisted venous return. So that led to more changes in oxygen gendered uh, changes and defomers and filters and the membranes to remove the air from the circuit. Hemoconcentrator. In the mid 70s, I believe that was about the time, it may have been the early 70s, uh, we, we were required to rinse the hemoconcentrators for our pediatric patients. And Dr. Romanoli did a wonderful studies on those. Eventually the technology changed and the manufacturers were able to make them pre rinsed like they're using today in a wide variety of sizes for adults and pediatrics. Auto transfusion. <laughs> I recall attaching a vacuum to the top of a uh, non-filtered cardiogony reservoir, attaching a depth filter below the reservoir, attaching that filter to a roller pump piece of tubing, and we would pull this defoam filtered blood and pull it out during these massive blood loss, and then we would pump it into an IV bag or a blood bag and return it back to the patient for cardiopulmonary bypass. Somewhere around the um, mid-70s, I recall one of the first uh, auto auto transfusion devices came out on the market. I believe it was the hemonetics. It could have been something else. But anyway, we later bought one. So we thought we would try auto transfusion in our cardiac surgery rooms. Well, I tried it for several months for Dr. Cooley's cases. And we tried and we tried and we tried, but he never lost enough blood for us to process. So I had to put the, I had to put this auto transfusion device in the closet because uh, it was, didn't work. Uh, we just didn't have any blood to process. And eventually it was uh, removed from the storage room in the late seventies, early eighties. And then they started using auto transfusion devices for uh, a wide variety of procedures. And of course, more surgeons, but I don't recall Dr. Cooley needing them very often. And uh, so we adjusted to the times. Metal devices, we clean and re-sterilized uh, metal suctions, adult and pediatrics, uh, metal connectors, adult and pediatrics, uh, and even the cannula that we were using for our PD and infant uh, cases at that time. Eventually they were replaced with disposable plastic devices in the mid and late seventies, maybe early eighties, all of them were replaced. So everything was disposable by then. And it allowed us to do more cases, <laughs> a lot faster turnaround. Heater coolers, we modified the early SARNs modular heater coolers to include one of the machines. We actually cut a large hole in the top and then we could put ice in it, but we had to turn off the heater elements on the inside. Well, we mounted these two heater cooler devices side by side, one for cooling, one for warming, and then we wired everything together and we could strategically place clamps on these wide tubing so we could cool, we could rewarm, we could recirculate, uh, whatever was necessary. <clears throat> now, the nice thing was those were finally discontinued and then newer model uh, heater coolers came out of the market that you use today, like the SARS dual heater coolers, the Kimray, uh, I don't think it has a heating limit on it. I think it went up to about 50 degrees. And the Medtronic and Yoser McKay, Alpha Omega, Cincinnati Sub-Zero, the Soren 3T and the Cardio Equip. So there's a wide variety of these things, but our history helped develop and improve these devices over the year. Roller pumps. We initially used the modular roller pumps and uh, <laughs> had to use wrenches to adjust them for the occlusions. And eventually we got the deluxe heads from Sarns and et cetera. And then we had the uh, some console pumps. And the auto transit. And so we use these modular roller pumps for not just cardiopulmonary bypass, we use them for auto transfusion, you know, remove the blood, defoam it, filter it, return it to the patient. Uh, we also use them for ECMO roller pumps, and we use them for left heart bypass. I'm sure most of you in this room have never done a left heart bypass with a roller pump, but a few of us have. 
uh, just quite a unique uh, experience. Uh, and of course, the pumps we had did evaluate were like from Sarns and Trumo, Polystan. The Polystan pump was very unique. It was from Denmark uh, or uh, over there. And then the, it had a vertical pump. It was like a V type shape and it would occlude the things. It was a really a nice pump. Uh, and we used it for a while. And then we've also evaluated and used the Yoster McKay, the Spectrum Quantum, and et cetera. We also did a, a short comparison study between uh, pulsatile flow and non pulsatile flow with the roller pumps. Uh, and of course, this is using when we were using a bubble oxygenator, not a membrane uh, that does, you know, the, does change that pulse matter quite a bit. Uh, but anyway, our experience with the pulsatile perfusion didn't prove to be a significant contribution for cardiopulmonary bypass. And I attribute part of that to the fact that our cases uh, with Dr. Cooley and uh, Ott and Rule and uh, uh, Hallman, et cetera, this group, most of our cases were like 30 minutes, maybe up to an hour. Uh, and of course, many of the graduates, like Steve, after graduated, goes to her program, their average bypass time was five hours. And ours was using 30 minutes to an hour. And he was never, not quite prepared for that when he graduated. And he expressed those thoughts to me later. Uh, centrifugal pumps. The first centrifugal pump designed for cardiopulmonary bypass was by Harold Kletzko, MD, and engineer Edson Rafferty. They successfully tested this device in a laboratory on Dr. Kletzka's sister, Barbara. Uh, she and I have been corresponding quite a bit in the past few years, in partly because I was not aware of it, but Dr. Cooley used the very first biopump in 1975. Um, and it was um, uh, August the 14th, 1975 to be exact. And I saved that pump after the case was over with. It was on a 10 year old Jehovah's Witness. That morning we thought we were gonna be adult and we didn't. We might've done a pediatric case, Jehovah's Witness did really well. And so I saved it, cleaned it out and I've been using it in my lectures for the past 45 years or so. And I think that's probably one of the most significant contributions besides the roller pump is that uh, centrifugal pump, the bio pump, because it led to the design and the development of other companies and their devices for centrifugal pump technology. But we, again, were the first. That unique pump technology, again, led other companies to designing a variety and updating their centrifugal pumps for cardiopulmonary bypass, left heart bypass. What a wonderful thought, and going from roller pumps to left heart to centrifugal pumps. And of course, ECMO too. And of course, these companies came out were Medtronic and Bard Livestream, Soren Revolution, Yoster McKay, Rotaflow, Jerome OCP, and et cetera, and others. <clears throat> Hema dilution. We originally primed our pumps with 20 cc's per kilogram of D5RL. Oh, oh, glucose, oh goodness. Or as low as 800 milliliters. Eventually we did change our priming protocol to consist of other solutions. And we also used one quarter, three eighths and half inch tubing strategically in the various parts of the circuit to reduce our overall prime. And uh, with and without blood, just like people do today and eventually uh, other crystalloid solutions. It's been rewarding in the past several years to see perfusionists bringing back techniques that we used back in the 70s. I'd like to take this time to comment on a few PHI milestones of the perfusion school. It was because of the support of our perfusion students in 1977, let's see here. They were the ones that participated in all those cases that particular year. We did more than 4,000 pump cases here at Texas Heart Institute with those students from 1977, including these eight or 10 uh, staff. And those same students also contributed uh, to our achieving our 25,000th open heart procedure at Texas Heart Institute. Oops. Support for the perfusion students in 1983 helped these 15 perfusionists complete more than 4,000 open heart procedures or pump procedures. And they also contributed to our achieving 50,000th pump case at Texas Heart Institute. Uh, Raymond, you're way back in the back of this slide, back in the tall guy back in the back near the left, he's over there. Uh, it's a lot of good people here. Support from our perfusion students in 1983 helped uh, those perfusions, like I mentioned, do those cases. And in 2001, it helped THI to complete their 100,000th procedure. 
Currently, all the perfusion students have participated in over 125,000 open heart procedures here at Texas Heart Institute. Now, my following comments relate to the people who helped manage the program uh, before, beginning, after, and et cetera. I went to work uh, for medical manufacturing in the late 70s, early 80s, and Diane Clark went to work for hospital administration in 1980. Trudy Stafford uh, is there, is, uh, was a December 79 graduate, and she became the next uh, associate director of academics or, or associate director in 1981. She also co-authored the, uh, uh, the edition, the second edition of cardiopulmonary bypass. I wanted to point out, it's really not the second edition. That was an entirely different title. The first title was cardiopulmonary perfusion. This one was cardiopulmonary bypass, but basically it was the second edition. We also, the company I worked for, we also reprinted it in a different color. We went from red to blue. I don't know why, who knows. This is also important because our students from June of 1980 class and December of 1980 class, they, they participated in another major milestone here at Texas Heart Institute. They helped us complete 5,014 open heart pump procedures that one year. 5,000 cases a year in those several rooms that we had was a remarkable task by everyone at that time. And it's the greatest number, I think, was a little over 50 cases in one day. Ray McInnes, and he's here today, is, uh, is, was a June 1976 graduate. Um, I do need to point out, I was not a nice person back in the 70s. <laughs> uh, and that's since changed. Mm. And I, I attribute part of that to Raymond. He's a, he's a nice person. And Charlie was a little bit harder. And Charlie convinced me to push people to the limits one step beyond. Raymond was a nicer person. So I take that with hope. Anyway, Raymond was, and uh, Charlie was uh, working on that transition of, of our program from a, a one-year program to a Bachelor of Science program at the University of Texas Health Science Center here in Houston. And their first graduating class was in December of 83. And uh, this is the same year that the students helped us participate in 50,000 open heart case done at Texas Heart Institute. So two remarkable things uh, for Raymond at that time. Now, Charlie retired in 1985 and Raymond became the chief perfusionist and the director of the perfusion school. The BS degree was offered from 80, 1983 until about 1985, I'm sorry, 93. And in 93, the UT program decided to reduce the number of allied healthcare programs. Uh, and uh, the THI School of Perfusion returned to becoming a one year uh, perfusion program. And it was approved by the ACPE and the KHAP accrediting agencies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, Raymond continued his role as the chief perfusionist and director of the school, and, and Trudy continued her role as the associate director. And they did an amazing, a remarkable job when it came to perfusion technology and to perfusion education. They found other opportunities to pursue in 2002. And I was working for Raymond at that particular time. I'm not sure why he hired me, but he did. And uh, I was accepted uh, as their replacement in 2002. I remained the chief perfusionist here at THI until January of 2012. And this is when the perfusion department was transferred to St. Luke's Hospital and the Catholic Health Initiative. I retained the position as director of the school until I retired in 2020. Uh, the perfusions at St. Luke's and CHI uh, continue to provide the perfusion services for the hospital. And they also continue to provide clinical, <clears throat> excuse me, clinical guidance to the students uh, under their clinical affiliate agreement between St. Luke's and THI. Uh, the students also gained additional uh, clinical experiences now uh, because they are rotating to other clinical affiliates uh, around the country. I hired uh, Deborah Adams as the Associate Director of Academics in 2016, and uh, Debbie became the Director of the School with Kathy Kibler when I retired, and uh, that was in 2020, right after COVID started. Good time for me, huh? Bad time for them. Together, they have expanded the program from one year to 18 months. And everybody will agree they have done an absolutely remarkable job in improving perfusion education, especially during the pandemic. This has made an overall positive impact in our perfusion community that we've served. Other tidbits I've looked up. <laughs> 
I reviewed the 2022 American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion website and found that these, there are 5,300 certified perfusionists in the country. I think I counted them correct, but I'm not sure. And in reviewing the names, I found that there were 544 Texas Heart graduates that are still certified. That's about 10% of the market. The American Board also has another category for emeritus status, and I reviewed it, and there were 839 perfusionists under that category. 123 were Texas Heart graduates. So that's almost 7% of us retired out of that group. Uh, I tried to keep up to date on all the THI graduates and sadly found that there were 47 who passed away in the past 50 years. Before Dr. Cooley passed away, <clears throat> we discussed on many occasions how proud we were of the academic and the clinical um, <clears throat> education of perfusion uh, that our students were receiving here at Texas Heart Institute. And we were very pleased with the adult and the pediatric research done by these students because it was their diligent work that led us to making changes in perfusion techniques and including perfusion technology. We also found it rewarding to know that our Texas Heart graduates continue to provide academic, clinical and research support to many cardiac groups around the, in the United States and other countries around the world. I reminded him that part of their success <laughs> was uh, because they followed his motto. And Dr. Cooney's motto was to modify, simplify, and to apply. I tried to, I've always tried to encourage students to treat patients as a member of their family or as a friend. And eventually, as they graduate, <laughs> they would become an extension of the Texas Heart Institute and the hospital, clinical rotation sites where they did their uh, work. This was important to me because in the past 50 years, I've had numerous family members and friends that required scheduled and emergent cardiopulmonary bypass or open heart surgery around the country. And I know that my family members and my friends both were getting the best of care no matter where they were because it was either a Texas Heart graduate or a graduate from another perfusion program. And I knew they all did their best. In closing, I'd like to repeat something Dr. Cooley mentioned. That was, there are three objectives to the THI School of Perfusion Technology. Those are to provide excellence in patient care, research, and education. He also said it's the responsibility of the Texas Heart Institute administration to continue its commitment to the outstanding students and the faculty here at the TX, THI School of Perfusion Technology. The stone heart that you find that you'll see here in front of uh, Texas Heart Institute is referred to as the symbol of excellence. Uh, someone else I forgot to mention earlier and I'd like to thank and that's Joe Pruthen <laughs> for helping me create these slides today. Uh, I called him at the last minute and kind of threw them together because I didn't know what I was doing. So thank you, Joe. <laughs> And uh, I would encourage all of you to review the Texas Heart Institute website and go to the perfusion section and you can click on that and you can learn more about the school. You can also see photographs or pictures of all of our past graduates for the past 50 years um, and the research that we're doing. And there's a, a place you can click on down at the bottom of the thing that uh, you can go back and look at past events and pictures from past events. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today and attending the session, even online. So thank you very much, everybody.